But then this guy in college, he was a wholesome guy, kind of like a golden boy. I fell for him and he wasn't interested in that way. That's when it all just crumbled. I was like, he's like the best guy I've ever met and he didn't want me. I come home that night and I just weep. Like just that ugly weeping, that weeping where you don't have energy to do anything else. And I go to God, cause he's my genie. And so I go to God and I say, God, please never let me fall in love with another person unless it's who you have for me, I'm done. And I think that was the first time I ever gave anyone willingly control. I'd been trying to finesse my way, manipulate my way, change myself to get what I wanted. And in that moment, something was impressed on me. This thought that comes from not me. That just said, you treat me like a genie and I can be so much more than that. Family has a lot of, I'll say, supernatural touch points going back generations. So we've got We've got witchery, we've got astrology, we've got spirits, we've got ghosts, we've got all these kind of things. And I grew up hearing these stories and they intrigued me, they entertained me, and then they scared me. But I guess the blessing in disguise looking back is I knew the spiritual was real. Mm. So I never doubted it because I knew my family had dabbled or at least been encountering things they couldn't explain for generations. And so as a kid growing up, you know, our house had some little baby Bibles in it and stuff. My dad, Catholic, my mom, you know, Protestant, neither going to church because they couldn't agree. Mm. We did have, you know, prayer, but I treated God like a genie. You know, I didn't really know how to address him. I didn't understand Jesus's role in anything. I had never even thought about what the Holy Spirit was, meant anything. I knew there was a God up there. There was a demon down at the bottom that had lost some battle and was making our lives terrible. And I loved all the horror of it, all the thrill of it. For some reason, even though I knew he was the losing side, I loved watching scary movies. I loved hearing about scary movies ever since I was little. And they would freak me out, but I took this thrill in watching them so that next time I would know what to expect. And so that was kind of my first thing I can look back and realize it was all about control for me. Mm. It was all about wanting to control my reaction and stay cool, calm, collected, put together, perceived as having it together and figured out. And this is when I'm like a little kid. And on the other hand, you know, I'm loving all of this stuff. And on the other hand, I have this older than my years depression and loneliness that I couldn't explain. I had two parents that loved me. I had, growing up, I had friends that cared and I couldn't explain the loneliness and the depression away. I'm just going deeper and deeper into horror movies. It's kind of like you get your fix. That's not scary anymore. I need something scarier on one side. And on the other side, I'm convinced that having the right guy will one day fix my loneliness because you know, you're depressed. And so as a kid, you escape into TV, you escape into video games, you escape into books. And so I just dove into fantasies where the girl is secretly a part of something bigger. And that's what I wanted. I wanted to be part of something bigger. And I wanted to be on the winning team, but I didn't know how. And I didn't know, it seemed like the world was pretty mundane and basic and I didn't have access to the things and the stories I grew up hearing, nor anything on the other side that wasn't scary. I just had my everyday life where I was just depressed as you know, a single digit kid. I had anxiety from all the control and the pride, the wanting to please people, the wanting to prove my worth. I was convinced that to get that great guy, I had to be great, so I had to have everything together. And I'm saying these things as like a nine-year-old, as a 10-year-old, it doesn't make any sense looking back, like what kind of mind did I have as a kid? But I just was obsessed with getting rid of these feelings and escaping from them. So, you know, I'm a 10-year-old kid, at two, I had developed something called trichotillomania. And so it's a compulsive hair pulling that comes with anxiety. I consider it a blessing that it only ever affected my eyebrows. It was so bad that like I pretty much didn't have them. And so I would go to school and get made fun of sometimes. Sometimes I would do the making fun of another kid just so I could have a break from being made fun of. And I still have other friends, but that wasn't good enough because everyone didn't like me. As I got older, now I'm starting to notice boys, boys are starting to notice you, 
But at the same time, none of the guys I liked were ever noticing me. You know, it's the dudes that I didn't notice that noticed me. The dudes I noticed didn't notice me. And so again and again, let down, heartbreak, rejection, frustration, feeling like I'm not good enough yet. If none of the guys I like like me, then I am not good enough yet. I remember back then I would be every once in a while pr like praying to God like a genie, like, please, like, make them like me. And it never worked. And I just kept feeling like, what am I doing wrong? Why am I not good enough? I have friends. I, my parents like me. Like, what, what, what am I doing wrong? When I was 12, my parents split up. So at that point, I still got to see my dad almost every day, but I lived with my mom. And at the time, I didn't realize that was impacting me, but it just reinforced the need to have a relationship that was now better than my parents tenfold. It had to be better than my parents' relationship was. It had to be stronger. I had to have it more together. I had to be better than the, th the flaws I saw in myself from my parents. And the pressure just kept mounting. So you go through high school and you start you know, trying to act like even more, nothing's together in high school. You know, you're changing. You don't know what you're talking about. You're trying to impress people. You're trying to figure out who you actually are. You're trying to get good grades. You're trying to balance it all. I had nothing figured out, but I was still trying to pretend that I did. And then in the background, oh yeah, I'm addicted to pornography since I've been 10. You know, just hiding it, pretending it's not there and still trying to you know, navigate that big ball of shame that I have that I, I can't seem to escape. And at the same time, I'm kind of justifying it like, well, you know, I have just enough of this background in Bible to, and my parents raised me, you know, virginity is valuable. You know, it's a gift and you don't want to just let anybody, you know, mess around with you. So I'm like, well, hey, look, this, this isn't hurting anybody and it's going to keep, it's going to curb my appetite until I find that one amazing guy that's going to solve everything. So again, control. I'm trying to control my own passion by doing something and exploiting the people on the screen, right? And, and feeling guilty about it every single time as soon as, you know, the story's over, as soon as the, the, the video stops, you know, feeling that shame, that guilt, that isolation, like I'm, I'm a freak. Who else does this? I go through high school, I graduate high school, I get into college, cool check mark, another thing that makes you have it all together. Now I'm gonna be around other people that have it all together. And this whole time I didn't realize that I really had nothing together. I was really messed up. So thank God that nobody was accepting my offer of relationship because it wouldn't have lasted anyway. It would have been a huge waste of time, but instead I just was focused on the rejection. So I go to college and in college, still more rejection, except now it's even more chaotic because now there's tens of thousands of people on campus and the emotions are heightened because everybody is so low, you know? And so everybody is like trying to figure out who they are and everything. And I'm starting to, you know, I guess pump up my resume. So I have it more together. And at the same time, I'm looking at all that media that I've been going to to escape my depression. And I'm realizing this isn't helping anything. Like all this media I'm watching, like all these, things, these movies, these books, they're all just getting darker and darker. The music videos are getting weirder and weirder. Like what, what's going on? Why is the world getting worse? I thought we're supposed to be getting better. I, I thought we were, you know, all this education that we all have, you know, we're supposed to be valuing women. Why are women being more degraded? We're supposed to care about people. Why are we tearing each other down? Why is everything depressing? Why are all the good values that the, the few things that I was trying to get with this magical relationship? Why are those things being mocked and laughed at in movies? Why is everything that I've wanted being torn down and mocked by the thing I go to for escape? So I started realizing how much the occult, the spiritual world I'd heard as a kid about, how much it was infiltrating things, how much people were falling in love with it and using that as inspiration for the things that I was trying to consume. And it made me feel scared. It made me feel less in control than ever because now it wasn't just, I need to pull myself up by my bootstraps and be a, a, a great wifey material. Now the world's falling apart because people are starting to believe in the demons that I've been trying to prove I was braver than my whole life. So I started trying to take more control. You know, every, like when I look back, there's just so many times where I'm trying, I see a big problem. So I quickly scramble to figure out how I can get control. And so I remember, 
I started looking for fun at the horoscopes in the school newspaper and I realized they kind of would align in some way with my day. Now, of course, they're so generic that they would, you could read into them, but it made me go and get deeper into astrology. Like what's my, what's my sun position, my star sign, what's, what planets are in alignment, you know, all of the stuff that I used to dive into. And I started like looking at who I was, what it said I was, what all these different horoscopes and zodiacs from around the world said I was, all these personality tests. And then I started wanting to, to analyze other people because I was like, this is how I'm going to improve. This is how I can find someone compatible with me. Like I was so neurotic. I was so trapped in my own mind because of how desperate I wanted to fix myself. I saw what, that I was so messed up and I was playing this game with everyone like, no, I have it all together. You know, I'm, don't worry, you guys can come to me, you can confide in me, I have it all together, I've got great advice, but I couldn't follow any of it myself. I started going deeper and deeper into astrology. I spent hundreds of dollars in astrology books. And at the same time, I'm scared of the occult. So I start, you know, looking into like protective crystals and stuff like that. You know, this is all starting to come to a head. And then yet another relationship, because some of them would start up, but they would fail really quickly or really messy, or I'd realize that I have egg on my face because they were just playing me or, you know, whatever. So one of those big ones comes around and I feel so bitter. It's like that was the straw. Like I felt so bitter and ashamed and mad. I was so resentful at men because every time I liked one, if he did pursue me back, he wanted my body. He didn't actually want me. And I felt like this is all they want. This is all they want and they feel great about it. They can walk away feeling so empowered and I feel like a fool. And so at the beginning of my senior year in college, I decide that I'm going to make a list. And so I make a list because, you know, I'm in control of lists, right? And I write down all the guys I thought were cute that maybe if I hung out enough with them, I'd end up liking. And instead of doing that, I decided to hook up with them. Now, of course, I'm still the girl who watches porn so I don't have sex. So I don't go all the way, but I mess around enough and then I just walk away. Maybe they think they're going to get more. Maybe they think, maybe they secretly like me and I'm going to, I'm going to end up with them, but nope, I'm just going to walk away. I'm doing to them and they, those specific guys hadn't done that to me, but I'm treating them like I felt I'd been treated by all the guys before them. You know, at the end of this, I got every single one. And that I think made me feel the most shame the most embarrassment because when I just offered up my body, I could get every guy that I liked. But if, you know, no matter how great I thought he was, how upstanding, I could just do it. But before when I had been trying to actually get to know them and treat them like a human being, none of them would have it. So I think that that just like that broke me even more. I was on this cuspus of like, I'm not going to find that guy, am I? guys are all the same. Like, how am I ever going to find him if that, like, I just confirmed a pattern with like eight people in the span of three weeks. I felt like a superstar on one. And I was like, wow, well, at least I'm pretty because they definitely, you know, are excited about this. But then jokes on me at the end of these three weeks, because then I walk away with herpes. And now I'm like, oh, so now I'm that loser virgin who all I have to offer is herpes. That's the most embarrassing thing ever. That's the most humiliating, pathetic story ever. And so I'm sitting there at the beginning of my senior year where you're supposed to be on top of the world, feeling like, cool, I'm about to check all the boxes, get a cool job, you know, all this. And I'm just feeling like an idiot. You sit there with the egg on your face again, and you're like, I just can't get it right. I can't get anything right. I have done all the check boxes, and yet I'm still here. And I've done all the astrology, to find God, you know, to learn more about my, like, and I'm still here. This, this, this loser who did this to herself. It wasn't even that like a guy pursued me. It's that I, when I finally decided to act that way, I get it. Cut scene, you know, one of my best friends, one of my best guy friends at the time, he decides to uh, take me to his teacher. He has a teacher that's training him on how to harness his energy. And so he takes me to a witch's house and she looks like any lady you'd see walking around the grocery store. You would never know, right? And I don't really know what I'm walking in at the time. You know, I go into her house and I'm already feeling like this shame 
right? I'm already feeling low, like I'm out of control. And here comes a witch who's opening her house up to me, welcoming me in and offering to give me all this power. Now, whatever it is, like whatever, you know, she actually knows how to do whatever. I never really got into it because I was only there for one night. But while I was there, I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Like, I know that spirits are real. I know demons are real. I know there's a God up there that like can like smack them around. But this lady's not a witch. She's just like an everyday crazy lady. She's kooky. Why are you even wasting your time with her? And then she's walking me around, you know, stand in your power, power spot in the room and all this, all this stuff. And I'm just humoring her because I'm like, I really just want to go. This is the most awkward thing. I don't want to laugh at her. And then finally she sits me down on the couch and she says, fight me. And I think we're about to like go, like she's going to try and hit me or something. She just puts her hand against my chest. And I'm, in my head, I'm just like, what is this woman? Like, she's crazy. And then all of a sudden she's like, go. And all of a sudden there's this heat court. Like I feel heat radiating through my chest. My heart's racing faster. Like I had just been terrified or run three miles and I have no idea what to do. And all that comes to me is that like Stephen King movie about all those little kids that can read minds, like little alien kids. And so I'm just imagining a brick wall in my head. Cause I'm like, I don't know what to do. This is real. And I don't, I'm an idiot again, having no idea how to do this, but I have to again, pridefully make it look like I'm cool and calm and act like I do know, but I have no idea what I'm doing. And she keeps yelling at me, bite me, keep me out, keep me out. And I'm clearly not. And I'm so scared. And all I say in my head is just like, help me. And it's like a door shuts and she look and she kind of like comes back and the heat goes away and my heart calms back down. And I have no idea what I did, did nothing. Right. I couldn't claim responsibility for that at all. And she is kind I realize she's kind of like me. She wants to look like she's in control and she's like, good job. I can work with you. She quickly turns the tables to, to regain control by offering me control, offering me what she has. I kind of just laugh her off because I just want to get out of there. And I say, hey, I really got to go. I got class in the morning, got work in the morning. I got to go. Do you need a ride home? My friend didn't. He said she would drive him. And I left. Now I feel like this loser. You know, I go home for break and breaks are, you know, several weeks long. And I have this dream really inappropriate dream wasn't enjoyable but it was very inappropriate and when i woke up i was groggy and the bed was moving back and forth these are the parts of my story that i used to only tell a few people because it's intimate it's invasive it's embarrassing but these are kind of things that make people feel alone and so that's why you share them right um that's why i I just feel like it has to come out eventually because I don't want people to feel alone like I did in that moment. I, I had nothing to make sense of it. It was almost like you go about the rest of your day like time to make breakfast because you have no idea what the heck it was. But in the back of your mind, you're like, that's not normal. That's not right. That's not OK. I don't know what happened to me. But something was there. My bed was moving and I was awake enough that like I got up and the bed was still moving and I jumped out of it and I was whimpering and then it was done. And so finally I had my own ghost story to tell, but yet I had no explanation and I had no way out. And I just chalked it up to my life's crazy. I just went back to college and then at college, and this is the bit, this was the big one. There was a guy, cause I was starting to learn the war, like this God up there, he's the answer but that's a lot of work and I'm not ready for work. So I was starting to think about that God up there. And, and, he, and where did that come from? I think because growing up, sometimes I would pray for things, treating him like a genie, but those miraculous prayers would be answered. And I wasn't saying them out loud. And it was almost like a mercy, like I am here. And, you know, I had parents that, you know, that raise them up in the way they should go. Like I did have some Bibles. I did have some, you know, I knew about Jonah and the whale. Well, I knew the story. I didn't have any idea about the meaning, but Jonah and the whale, God can put a man in a whale. Uh, Noah, God can put a man in a boat, you know? <laughs> um, 
Jesus, God can put a guy on a cross, but I didn't get it. But I had, I knew that God was real. And the more I was diving into learning about the thing I was scared of, right? The occult, when I was looking about crystals and all this stuff and what people believe, every other deity was allowed at the party except Jesus. And Jesus belonged to God in my, you know, I was like, Jesus and this Bible God, they go together. You know, that's his son. And I still didn't know what that meant, but I was like, that's the Christian Jesus. And he's not allowed the party. You can flip his cross upside down. Now you're welcome at the party. You can twist his scripture. Now you're welcome at the party. You can speak his words backwards. Now you're casting spells at the party, but you can't invite Jesus. So I was learning demons don't like Jesus. That thing that rocked my bed really doesn't like Jesus, but I have to read the Bible to really be with God. That was what I was thinking. And that's a lot of work. Cause all I remembered as a kid is like King James and I hated Shakespeare. I was like, that's not good. like, I got to put that off a little longer. I didn't know there were other versions. I didn't know that there was like, you know, the ESV and the NLT and the NIV. Like, I didn't know there was a one I could really understand. I knew there were kids books and I knew there was the thou shouts, you know, and I didn't know how to figure it out for myself. I didn't have confidence I could. I didn't think I was smart enough to wrap my head around it. So I just kept kind of walking by. But then this guy in college, he went to mass every week. He only missed it once and got food poisoning and never again did he miss mass. And he was a wholesome guy, kind of like a golden boy, you know, and I fell for him. And here I am back in my old pattern. Right. Except now in the back of my head, I'm like, I have herpes. This is a good guy. He's, you know, he's kind of holding out with the same kind of plans. He's got values. He's got morals. He knows this God and this Jesus thing. You know, I could like, I, I, I was kind of camped out there for a little while and I wait the whole year. You know, we're just friends. We're good friends this whole year. I wait the whole year till I graduate. And then I let him know. And I mean, he was not cruel at all. He was just honest and he wasn't interested in that way. And that's when it all just crumbled. I was like, he's like the best guy I've ever met. And he didn't want me. And I was very open and honest about who I was, what I had, what I had done. And he accepted me as a friend, right? But he did. And so I just went home. I, you know, I, I tried not to cry the whole time I was in a cap and gown because I told him like the day before I was going to walk across the stage and get a diploma. So I'm trying not to cry. I'm trying to be excited about this. But at the same time, I'm just like, now where am I going in life? Like, I don't have a job lined up. I'm graduating, but I don't have a, the, the guy. I don't have a job. You know, what am I going to do? I come home that night and I just weep. Like just that ugly weeping, that weeping where you don't have energy to do anything else. And I go to God because he's my genie, right? And so I go to God and I say, God, please never let me fall in love with another person unless it's who you have for me. I'm done. And I think that was the first time I ever gave anyone willingly control. I'd been trying to finesse my way, manipulate my way, change myself to get what I wanted. And in that moment to this God that I did barely understood, not until you, I don't want anyone like if you want me to be single cool i don't want to ever have this ache in my heart again i don't want to waste time falling for anyone ever again unless you want me to and in that moment something was impressed on me this thought that comes from not me that just said you treat me like a genie and i can be so much more than that and i felt in that moment so much hope and so much shame at one time because I'm like, I'm so, I'm guilty of treating the God of everything like a mere genie in a bottle. Who the heck am I? So I chalked that up to that's another thing wrong with me. But at the same time, I was like, wait, but you talked to me, you heard me. And so in that moment, I was like, I need to read this Bible. You know, I'd been reading about the occult and a lot of, you, you start digging into that stuff. A lot of people bring up the book of Revelation and often it's a lot of Christians shining light on all the crazy stuff going on. So they're quoting Bible left and right. And I just kind of skimmed over that part because I was like, that's confusing. Just instantly I had this thought, Bible's confusing, gloss right over it, move on to normal English. But for the first time I was like, I'm going to start in Revelation. 
It took me a couple days, but I pulled out my laptop and I was secretly, because I was living with my mom at the time, I was secretly reading Revelation. Couldn't let her know. Pridefully, she'd been praying for me for years and I'd been arguing back and forth about, you know, there's little truth in everything. You gotta put it all together, you know, all this stuff. So pridefully, I was like, she can't know I'm a Christian. She'll, she'll know she was right or, you know, whatever you think when you're like barely out of teenage years. And so I read an annotated book of Revelation by this guy who just was called by God to do it, you know, and he just annotated it. So that means that every verse, then you might have to read like 16 paragraphs or maybe just five sentences about like what that means, what it's referring to elsewhere in the Bible, how it fits in. So in all that, like it took me, I think two weeks to read the book of Revelation after, after work, because at this point I had a job. After work every day, it took me like two weeks to read it. And at the end, because of all those footnotes, I understood what Jesus had done for me on the cross. And so alone on my couch, I can see myself just sitting there. I'm like, I think it's this easy. I think I just, I just say it, you know? And so in my heart, you know, in my head, I just said, I'm sorry, and I want you. And in that moment, I felt so much weight gone, so much hope, I was like giddy because I knew I was messed up, but now someone could fix me. And I knew life was still, like nothing had changed except this one huge thing, but he could change all the stuff that hadn't changed. And there was hope now, and it wasn't on me anymore. And I had, I was on the winning team. And now I was that girl, part of something bigger, but not in a horror movie kind of way where like I'm running around trying not to die, but in this way like, hey, you're the daughter of the king of heaven. You wrecked my world in the best way. My world needed to be wrecked because I had wrecked it so much and I was still trying to put together this sloppy kingdom for myself, thinking that I had to impress somebody, thinking I had to impress God. I grew up praying, Things like, Lord, because sometimes I would sense the need of like asking for not going to hell, but I didn't know what it meant. And I'd be like, Lord, if only if there's not enough room in heaven for everyone, let my parents go and I'll go to hell. You know, I didn't get it. I didn't get it at all. And in that moment, I was like, we can all go. And I got so excited. I was like, wait, we can all go. It's that easy. It's that easy. And, you know, a few weeks later, I got convicted because, you know, I read Revelation, then I read Genesis. You know, you read the end, then you read the beginning. Then I hit up a friend from high school, the only Christian I knew in high school, who was just unapologetically Christian, but still friends with everybody. I was like, hey, I think I'm a Christian now. What do I do? I've read Revelation and I've read Genesis. He's like, read Mark. And at this point, he was in divinity school and he was, you know, at a church up in Connecticut. And he's like, I'm actually preaching on it in a couple weeks. And so I drove up to Connecticut with my mom, met the girl he was going to marry, listened. He, his sermon was the first sermon I ever heard. It was about self-esteem and how that don't matter because it's what God says about you, not what you say. And that's exactly what I needed to hear. So I came back and said, I need a church. And so I prayed and I Googled and I was going to go church shopping. And I just went to that first church and it just felt like I came all dressed up you know, heels, dress, pea coat, early, like most people weren't even there. I learned later, you know, at church, and people don't always come early, but you know, I was there and I said, I don't have a Bible. I just assumed they would have a stack of Bibles for us sinners that just showed up, but they found me one because I was like, I don't have a Bible, but I know that's like what you do. You sit and you open your Bible and you read what they're saying. So they found me a Bible and I sat down and someone came right over, sat down with me and the pastor's wife came over and said, you're gonna love my husband. He's not here this week, but you're gonna love him. And the sermon, I don't even remember what it was about, but it was about grace. I went home and I told my mom, hey, I went to church today. Next week, would you come? Because she'd never found a church. And now her daughter, who she's been praying for, for at that point, 23 years, was inviting her. And so she started coming. God has done so much in my life, but helping me understand what grace is, helping me understand what grace is, how infinite his love is, that's the game changer. It's, it's allowed me to let go of so much 
um, and put him in the driver's seat over and over again. And I've seen it do the same for other people. And it's, it's amazing because when I came to him, I remember one night I was on my knees praying and I had this mental list of things I wanted in a guy and it was long, pretty much a unicorn list. Like this dude had to have like a race car and you know, like anime, but also have like this refined palette and be, you know, world, world travel and be mature and, you know, be able to build a house. And like, I don't like, just no wonder I couldn't get him. And I was trying to be everything on earth to get him and it didn't work. So I said, Lord, I'm doing away with this list. All I care about is that he loves you and he can make me laugh. And then at church, a few, it was a month to the day this guy shows up and he's got really cool tattoo sleeves. He's got like double zero or zero, I don't know about gauges, but he's got earrings in and he's alone and he's standing up just praising the Lord. And at that point I was not there to find a dude. I came to church to find Jesus, but he caught my eye and I was like, He's over there. He's, 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 you know, doing his thing. He's worshiping the Lord. But fast forward a couple years and, you know, a lot of focusing on Jesus because we both had that. He was coming back and I was coming for the first time. But now we're married. And what's amazing is when we were friends, I let him know up front. I just decided at that point, I'm just letting close people know, hey, I got herpes. You know, that's my life. Real talk. Lesson learned. Don't be foolish like I was. Right. And I tell him. Um, and we're 18 years apart. So this dude, he's grown, he's seen life. And I'm telling him this is this kid just straight out of college. And he's just like, oh yeah, that's annoying. Sorry about that. And then we keep jogging. <laughs> and so anyway, fast forward all this time, we get married, all this stuff. I get tested and it's gone. God took it away. Because, and that's not everybody's story. That's not the point. I'm just saying for me, it's one of the things he took away. There's, there's things in my story, like being addicted to pornography, that took longer. It took a lot of intimacy with the Lord. It took years, but he took that away. He's taken many amazing things away from my husband that he was grappling with, with our friends, with our family. We've seen amazing stories and it's it's different for everyone i know i know people now that still struggle with the same things that he took away from me i still have trichotillomania and i've come to to realize it's like it's because there's still a lesson there there's still a work to be done there and um and so i'm okay with that i trust him but we have a beautiful we have a beautiful girl i was about to say baby because she's always my baby but she's she's walking and talking and doing math now so she's not so little anymore but you know, this whole life, I realize it's all about giving up control to the only one who's actually in control. And the less of my life I try to hold on to, the more I give to him. You know, he's, he's redeemed finances that I royally screwed up. He's redeemed, you know, character flaws, you know, in me, in our marriage, you know, he, he, the grace that he gives me allows me to not beat people over the head with their flaws or hold them up high like they're perfect, but see everyone as just a person that needs his love. So all of that, you know, all, all that mess. And now, you know, I can ask him to rebuke demons out of my sleep. You know, I used to have nightmares and one night he's like, you should have called on me. So I started doing it and now they, I wake up and I think that that's, that's the story of my whole life is I called on him and I finally woke up. Michelle, who is Jesus to you? He's my everything worth having. He's my King of Kings. He's my Lord of Lords. He's my commander. He is my provider. He's my deliverer. He's my savior. He's my best friend. You know, he's my, he's my bridegroom. He's, he goes before me and he goes behind me and he's, he's what I lean on every single day. Not only do I lean on him, but he's the reason I can lean, you know, the breath of life. And so, you know, in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God and he's my God. Michelle, for people who are watching your testimony right now and 
feel they're not in a position to let that control go. And and they're in that same place, just holding on because um, this God doesn't seem real. Yeah. Maybe he hasn't come through in their lives. And right. they have been asking and asking. Yeah. And they don't want to let go. Right. What can you say from what you have experienced to those people who are just having a hard time letting go? Yeah. So my favorite verse is actually perfect because my favorite verse, it's John 6, 43. And my favorite translation is in the NLT. And it's, it's in quotations because it's Jesus speaking. And it said, stop complaining about what I said, said Jesus. He's talking to his disciples. And I think that in my own life, when I was trying to be in control, even, in, even now, you know, if I disagree with God, the creator of all things that knows everything and has all the power and the provision and provides all the stuff, I need to just stop complaining about what he said and do it or trust him or let go or wait or abide or rely or whatever it is that I'm feeling like that I'm fighting. What I got to do is I just got to stop complaining about what he said. So that's what I, that's what I tell people is just stop complaining about what he said mm. and try. We, we're terrible at keeping our own lives together. So what do you have to lose? Michelle, any last words for people who are watching your testimony right now? I'm praying for them. I think knowing that countless people will come across this video, I'm praying that you feel less alone, less misunderstood, less hopeless, and that you feel that giddiness I got to feel that day when I realized there's a way out.